This conference will now be recorded. Ram sir, you want something? Ram, what is Hi, So maybe you can uh, seek feedback on the WhatsApp group. Uh, yeah, so like the topic or any other improvement that we can bring about that we can. Yes. yes. Uh, Okay, so let me bring it for our for our for our for our for Okay. So, from two, you are echoing. Welcome, everyone. You are Two IDs, IDs, and hence you're echoing. No, no I need to log out of the one ID. No, I yes, I just gave it. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening, everyone. Sorry for this uh, interpretation. Let me recognize the presence of CA Mutuza Kachwala. Under his dynamic leadership, we have started for, from this financial year itself into audit study group. And this is the fifth series, what we are doing it on enterprise risk management, risk based series. Uh, presently, I also empower, uh, tell you that Mutuza sir is also re electing for the WRC. And presently is the chairman of internal audit study group. Uh, let me recognize uh, Thrupti uh, Gauri. Who, uh, she will be introducing Harsha, today's speaker. So, uh, Gauri, can you introduce Harsha for today's session? Sure, Bhavin. Thank you. Yeah. Happy evening, everyone. Uh, please, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Bhavin? Oh. Yeah. yeah. Happy evening, everyone. Uh, please join me to welcome Harsh. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce him. Uh, Harsh is the CEO of India Affiliate Institute of Risk Management and India Chairman of IRM Region Group. Uh, he's been delivering sessions in the risk, in enterprise risk management since the age of 21 and has educated almost 7,000 plus students from various backgrounds. Uh, he manages the IRM qualification examination and research projects in India. Uh, he's a commerce graduate from HR College in, of Commerce and Economics, Mumbai. He's a data accountant and alumnus of IM Bangalore, a technical specialist elected by the Institute of Risk Management UK. Uh, Harsh has over 11 years of experience in audit assurance, risk management, consulting, 
corporate finance including structuring strategic alliance and partnership he was previously associated with kpmg risk consulting where he worked on many risk uh, enterprise risk consulting assignment across south africa usa uk china and middle east uh, post kpmg he helped in setting up an entrepreneurship business school he was one of the 450 people to be elected in 2014 for a social entrepreneurship train journey across india which helped uh, him decipher in you know, decipher in rural and semi urban india he has also set up and managed micro uh, microfinance and bfc with a large financial service group where he scale up the profile uh, to usd 15 million with a team of 250 people across india and maintaining an npa of 0.2% uh, he has worked in multiple sectors manufacturing pharmaceutical education financial service cement or building materials retail charities not for profit uh he has write, written multiple articles in uh, say higher education digest education world your story uh financial express he was interviewed by cnbc tv 18 and he also has presented his views on national education policy with the other education leaders in the business world so it's a great pleasure to introduce harsh over to you thank you thank you gauri for the kind introduction and uh, thank you murtuza uh, uh, thanks to the entire wrc team it's an honor to always come back to the chartered accountancy uh, community i remember clearing the ca final exam in 2011 and uh, you know the value of the ca charter uh, is something which uh, doesn't seem to depreciate it only appreciates with time and uh, in this uncertain world that we are Uh, whether it's the pandemic or a financial crisis or asset bubble or reputation fake news across the world we are seeing a range of risks which uh, are not only going to impact organizations but we as individuals society uh, government uh, across the board every stakeholder is vulnerable to a range of risks and which is why understanding enterprise risk management has become need of the hour my topic for today is first we go into what is enterprise risk management and then the application of enterprise risk management in the manufacturing sector right uh, the idea is that how can we integrate erm within the manufacturing sector what are the different kind of risks and best practices that some of the organizations are following and then we'll have a q and a session towards the end where i'd like to understand from the participants today Uh, whether they are uh, you know running their own ca firm or practicing or working somewhere uh, as to how they would like to focus on enterprise risk management or help their clients or help organizations uh, build resilience uh, build a risk intelligent value chain uh, trying to assess and mitigate risk real time rather than just coming up with reactive measures which many organizations have been doing for the last uh, few years of course there are regulatory changes uh, which have taken place including sebi's lodr uh, listing guidelines where the top 1000 listed companies and these listed companies are not just banks and financial institutions uh, but uh, retail fmcg pharma manufacturing all these companies which uh, qualify for the top 1000 listed companies by market cap they are mandated to set up a risk management committee they are mandated to hire a chief risk officer and uh, you know the guidelines clearly say that you need to go beyond the traditional risks to identify risks from frauds cyber security supply chain and multiple other areas so this is uh, you know there couldn't have been a better time for chartered accountants to understand enterprise risk management as a subject in fact recently we uh, as the institute of risk management we also partnered with the bombay chartered accountancy society to kind of create a pathway uh, for chartered accountants to you know get into risk consulting as an opportunity uh, there are so many avenues available uh, especially in the tier 2 tier 3 cities where the big 5 or the big 4 organizations don't often tap uh, into those kind of markets because of the affordability but there are these firms and small organizations the msme segment who are in need for 
risk consultancy they want to understand what are the top five top ten risks either by likelihood impact or whatever it is uh, for their own organization so Bavin, you can go next so if you see the uncertain world that we are you know i've just taken a quick snapshot of what is happening around us uh, China's power cuts are actually creating such a huge uh, slowdown in the manufacturing output where factories are being forced to shut down. Uh, in Vietnam, if you see uh, three weeks ago, uh, there was a huge surge in the COVID cases and uh, they're also uh, running low vaccination rates and that has prompted all the companies to shift their manufacturing units, but they're struggling uh, to kind of move or come up with a business continuity plan. We're seeing a supply chain crunch overall, uh, whether it is a chip shortage or a coal shortage or, uh, you know, even the Suez Canal crisis that we saw. Uh, so such kind of events are, again, putting a lot of pressure on manufacturing companies. Uh, if you come back to India, companies are shutting plants, they're cutting outputs uh, because they're not able to cope with demand. And this is uh, possible in few sectors. Of course, automobile has uh, bounced back now, uh, but we did see some kind of setback uh, a few weeks ago chemical company uh, you know because of the gujarat pollution uh, board's order uh, they they've had to close their manufacturing unit so again uh, here the highlight is more on the environmental side of things the climate change uh, regulatory nods from the green tribunal or the pollution boards and then gm prepares to shut down the pune plant because they're not getting a clearance on the uh, the deal so again a regulatory risk more on the mna side joint venture side so if you see all these six events one is focusing on a power shortage. Second one, more on the COVID pandemic, uh, which is still causing so much impact. Uh, the supply chain crisis, regulatory output, uh, the pollution, climate change, ESG kind of risk. And last one is more on the joint venture m and organization structure. So this is the uncertain world we are in. And if in these testing times, we don't understand risk either from an internal or external environment, then it's going to be very difficult to sustain. You know, the average lifespan of a company is coming down to 12 to 15 years from 30 years, which means uh, by 2027 or 2030, uh, almost 50, 55 percent of the companies won't be existing anymore. That's the speed of innovation. That's the speed of uncertainty. Uh, and if we are not prepared, I think being prepared is becoming one of the biggest formulas for boardroom discussions three years back or five years back. Uh, the biggest discussion point in the boardroom was talent and compliance. Uh, and this is based on multiple surveys uh, conducted by PwC, KPMG, EY. Uh, and the idea here is that how do boards, how do risk committees, how do uh, chief executives at the top set the right tone? How do they develop a culture where risk is inbuilt in every department, in every ecosystem? And for a manufacturing unit, it becomes even more important because the value chain is so extensive. You've got suppliers, you've got customers, you've got government, regulatory bodies, employees, shareholders, so many stakeholders to manage. Your plant operations, your production, uh, raw materials, vendor related issues. And today we are going to understand that how a successful ERM program or a successful enterprise risk management program can actually enhance the survival of your organization. It will really transform uh, results in terms of uh, building the right uh, ecosystem. Next. So let's start by understanding what is risk, right? And when I often talk to uh, people at a webinar or at a live event, the first thing that people say that risk is negative. In fact, there was a survey that we had uh, uh, conducted a couple of years back uh, and the question was that risk refers to events with negative outcome and you won't believe 95% of the people who took that survey they said that yes risk refers to events with negative outcome so that's the default thinking of risk either it's an Indian uh, scenario because we always associate risk with a negative event even if you go back to your parents uh, family members grandparents the moment you talk about risk, they will say, huh, insurance le liya hai, right? The first thing you're looking at risk is you're transferring it to an insurance company. No one wants to take ownership of the risk or try and uh, arrive at a mitigation plan. Iska insurance hai. That means you're associating risk either as a negative event 
or something which is purely financial but today the importance of risk is qualitative it can stem from any area and if i go back to the iso 31000 definition risk is a combination of three important facts first one is effect second one is uncertainty and third one is objective we are all chartered accountants let's say our objective is to provide a true and fair view of the balance sheet of the company right that's a simple objective now any uncertain event which can impact these objectives which can have an effect on these objectives is called a risk as simple as that risk is not competition risk is not negative risk is not strategy risk is not legal risk is not procurement risk is not uh, hostile takeover risk is not people leaving the organization at the fundamental level let's understand risk is the effect of uncertainty on objective now you can have thousands of objectives i want to be successful i want to be happy i want to certify the balance sheet i want to grow my ca practice from 10 people to 30 people i want to have seven partners i want to expand into m a advisory and tax and due diligence these are all objectives and every uncertain event which has an impact on that objective is going to be called a risk according to the irm the definition of risk is again slightly tweaked it's the combination of the probability of an event and its consequence and the consequence can be positive or negative so this shows the opportunity side of risk why do we say that every crisis presents an opportunity that's because you need to spot that every risk has a positive side and i think we as indians know how to manage a crisis much much better than anyone anywhere in the world we are known to deal with problems we are known to come up with jugadi solutions right and that's why if you see risk as a definition it's the combination of the probability how frequency will an event occur and what is going to be the impact of that event and that events impact will be either positive or negative coming to risk management this is again an irm definition the process which aims to help organizations understand evaluate and take action on all their risks not just financial risks not just treasury risks all the risks with a view to increasing the probability of success and reducing likelihood of failure again what a fundamental change in the thing, uh, risk thinking you are talking about how risk can be used to enhance the probability of your success and reduce the likelihood of the failure and if you go by the COSO definition, now what is COSO? COSO is the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations. They are headquartered in the US. It comes under the Securities Exchange Commission. It was formed in 1985 by five private bodies and they set uh, various frameworks. So the first framework of COSO in enterprise risk management was in 2004. And the recent framework they have come up is 2017. It's a publicly available document. You can even visit uh, our IRM website because we have released a guidance on how to interpret the COSO and ISO standards on risk management. Now the latest framework on COSO 2017 focuses more on strategy and culture. The 2004 framework focused more on the overall operations, uh, you know, on the overall process level risk management. But now how risk can be integrated as a culture has been brought to the forefront in the 2017 paper. And here this definition Again, I'm showing you these definitions not for you to go into theory and academics. I'm trying to explain some very fundamental concepts which are often misunderstood when we talk about risk management. So, COSO says that ERM is a process affected by the board, the management, and other personnel, which means every single person in the company is responsible for ERM. It's not the board, it's not CFO, it's not risk committee even though regulators are mandating that the top management need to be involved but it's actually every personnel how is it applied in strategy setting now when i say strategy setting let's take an example of an ultra tech cement supposing they want to grow by x million tons year on year and they want to enhance their cement production capacity that strategy exercise will require an equal weightage on risk assessment right you can't just say let us set up a plant in Chhattisgarh or let us expand into Japan or let's start setting up some manufacturing units in Vietnam. You need to understand the local regulations. You will have to take local clearances. 
are you going to ensure that land acquisition is going to be an easy exercise whether it's a brownfield or a greenfield acquisition what about the regulatory compliances what about the people how are you going to comply with the labor laws so every element right from setting up the plant till running the plant uh, to wastages scrap uh, your uh, you know goods returns then your uh, vendor management local supplies rates quality everything carries a risk because it's linked to a business objective right so it's applied in strategy setting and it is across the enterprise whether it is your subsidiaries your joint venture companies your business departments your divisions today in fact one of the best practices i will share is there are companies who've started setting up people risk management practices they started onboarding psychologists who are working uh, as consultants to support the mental wellness of employees and this is sector agnostic not just manufacturing companies every company which wants to adapt to good uh, people risk management guidelines they are trying to bring such on call psychologists on board to just support these staff who are coming back from the lockdown resuming office going back into the office trying to make sure that these people are comfortable going back to the definition it is designed to identify potential events that may affect the entity and manage the risks within the risk appetite thereby giving reasonable assurance this is something which uh, is missing on the slide but giving reasonable assurance on the achievement of the objectives so ultimately your enterprise risk management is not a compliance it is not something which you are supposed to do just to fill up a report or release to the investors or put in your annual report it is actually designed because it will provide reasonable assurance on the achievement of the entity's objective if a firm a company has an enterprise risk management process which is implemented effectively be rest assured that as a statutory auditor as an internal auditor you will be able to certify that the entity's objectives will be reasonably achieved because that erm process is going to take them there it's going to be involved in the strategy it's going to be involved in the process it's going to be involved in every department and that's why i keep saying that risk intelligence is required at every level it's not just required at the top every level every employee needs to be a risk manager they need to understand risk management next bhavin we can go next now this is an ideal ERM process. How do we start with enterprise risk management? The first step is establishing the context. And when I say establishing the context, it means understanding the firm's objectives. What are the typical objectives or a vision statement or a mission statement for a manufacturing company? It could be improving quality, reducing the costs, increasing workplace safety improving supply chain efficiency increasing sustainability and i don't open to uh, having some people write on the chat box what do you think are some of the objectives of a manufacturing company i'll give you 30 seconds just go back to the drawing board think about what are the three or four business objectives or strategic objectives for a manufacturing company just put down your thoughts on the chat box customer satisfaction okay that's a very good point often seen in a vision statement of a company that they want to ensure customer satisfaction anyone else uh, could it be a preferred employer sure so you are linking it to uh, more of an hr agenda if you see the third point increase workplace safety you can also add that uh, increase you know workplace attractiveness uh, enhance brand reputation from an employer perspective 
so we've got someone covering the sales side uh, i don't know who spoke but the, the gentleman who spoke focused more on the hr side anyone else who wants to bring in supply chain is covered sustainability is already talking about your esg and climate change and reducing carbon footprint and other objectives cost is looking at overall operations and process level activities quality is more about a production activity workplace safety again comes in uh, health safety environment plus uh, hr preventive maintenance fantastic so that could be another uh, objective for a manufacturing setup technological innovations fantastic 3d printing artificial intelligence robotics ai blockchain we're moving into a completely disruptive world of digital innovation and as a manufacturing company if there is no innovation that again reduces your lifespan uh, because ultimately it will be linked back to cost and your survival if other manufacturing companies are coming up with better effective cost structures thereby passing on the benefit to the customers by way of heavily discounted prices something uh, which we've seen in china for decades uh, i think that is something which an indian manufacturing company will have to adapt to and that's also one of a strategic risk for small medium enterprises because how do you uh, you know raise capital to invest in technologically innovation innovative practices right so uh, it's good that we're having this conversation i'm just trying to bring one important point that every risk is interconnected you try to save uh, the organization from a technological risk there'll be another risk of funding because if you want to have technology you need capital now do you have enough reserves you want to raise external capital you want to raise debt and put money in technology what is the roi we don't know uh, you're going to see that for the next five seven years it may require an immediate capex investment so these are some of the challenges which are generally looked at a high level from an interconnectivity of risk point of view reinvent the purpose of existence with time so uh, mulchan ji if you can explain uh, you can unmute yourself just want to understand what do you mean by this so i will like to cite example of apple <clears throat> so yeah. if a particular product yeah. from which is like quite profitable and good one but the apple success is mainly on account of they see what would be the future right maybe the apple right. product which are probably relevant at this point of time may not be non existent maybe after 5 or 10 years right right no i think that's a great example and i'll also extend your example to say localization of products right uh, you have a manufacturing setup you've been doing fantastic production but are you localizing your products in certain regions which require uh, something which is absolutely tweaked to the local market uh, because that's going to decide your overall demand and acceptance of the product in the local market so fair enough that's a very good point in terms of the overall uh, purpose of the organization and this can be a strategic risk for many companies i think we've seen so many case studies initially when coke also entered india Uh, there were so many challenges in terms of acceptance uh, and we're seeing that with multiple products today great so this is the overall erm process that's the first step which is establishing the context we've discussed some of the objectives next one is the risk assessment if you see on this slide which has three important elements your risk identification your risk analysis risk evaluation and then once you complete the risk assessment you go into risk treatment and your risk treatment is nothing but your mitigation planning uh, the overall risk strategy mitigation strategies and post the risk treatment is when you record and report the risk either to the stakeholders uh, the regulators if you're a listed companies uh, internal employees they also need to understand that the organization is receptive to the fact that there are certain risks which exist sometimes organizations don't like to share that they feel that by sharing the risks with the employees or within the ecosystem you are putting the reputation of the organization at risk but i feel that having a risk aware culture actually enhances investor confidence and also employee confidence there are uh, annual reports of good companies if you see i'm going to show you the example of godrej i'm going to uh, give you references of companies like reliance industries uh, tata steel these are all good companies where 
the risk management practices are fairly advanced. If you see their annual report, the section of management discussion and analysis, they have actually disclosed what are the top five risks that the company faces? What are the best practices? Which frameworks are they using for risk management? We'll even see a screenshot of an annual report towards the end uh, from Ashok Leland. So this is the overall perspective of ERM. And I'd like to go deeper into now each of the steps. We'll spend some time on each steps uh, so that you are able to understand how enterprise risk management uh, process works for a manufacturing company. Next slide. So the first step of your risk assessment is risk identification. Now risk identification, there are these six techniques. And the first technique is process level risk identification. So probably Bhavind, we can go next. Now process level risk identification, we need to understand this more from the entire manufacturing value chain. Bhavin, if you can go next. Gaurav? Bhavin? Yeah, yeah, just wait. Gaurav? Gaurav? Ashu? Shit, just wait. Actually, there is some. Uh, Gaurav? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, so this is the process level uh, risk identification. I'll just repeat what I said. We are now into the ERM process for manufacturing companies. Uh, we started with understanding the firm's objectives, the high level vision and mission statement. We're now going into process level risk identification. Now, how do you do process level risk identification? The first one is understanding the value chain and the value chain analysis is nothing but your end to end process level overview of a manufacturing setup. You've got a firm infrastructure, which is your management, finance, legal planning. You've got the HR function, which is all your support professional development, employee retention, relation, performance, appraisals, exit, etc. You've got the tech department, which looks at your integrated supply chain, your ERP, communications, uh, future investment in technology. You've got your procurement, which is the real-time inventory management, communication with suppliers, ensuring critical raw materials are sourced, uh, reducing dependency on vendors, ensuring the quality of raw materials, and then you've got the core function, which is your inbound logistics, which brings in the raw materials, the operations, which is actually the production uh, and uh, development of the finished goods, then the outbound logistics or the supply chain side, moving into the sales and marketing, and finally the customer service. So this is the end-to-end -end process of a manufacturing setup. And you got to identify a risk at every stage. And that is the true essence of enterprise risk. If you just do traditional risk management, people are going to tell you, okay, delay in raw materials, over dependency on supplier. But I would like to understand what are the risks that you can spot from this value chain? And let me give uh, one or two examples. Uh, first one being delay in land acquisition, which I'm going to type on the text box. Uh, delay in land acquisition for new plant setup. This is one of the risks that I see uh, in the process level risk identification from the value chain. The second risk which I see is inability to adopt new technology due to uh, unavailability of funds. If you see the way I've drafted the risk or I've identified the risk, there is a due to and due to is nothing but the root cause. Just by identifying a risk, the activity is not done. You got to understand what is the source of the risk, because as we go into this process towards the end, you're going to face an issue in terms of what is the root cause and how do you kill the source? How do you ensure that the source of the risk is mitigated? OK, so delay in land acquisition, inability to adopt new technology due to unavailability of funds. Then I'm going to say increasing attrition rate at plants due to non-compliance with labor laws so here i've looked at the human resource side of risk 
and also the regulatory side of risk right it's clubbed under this because the root cause is coming from the legal department and the impact is coming in the hr department this shows how your risk is interconnected every uh, department can play uh, mudslinging activities it's because of this department something else happened and that's why you need to bring all these departments on the same page the fourth risk which i can see is uh, delay in turnaround time for delivery of goods from dispatch from plants right it's a classic supply chain issue uh, increasing customer complaints on finished goods this is more of the customer service risk and something that we've seen with companies like toyota which have had to recall so many products many years back and i think we we see that generally in automobile companies where there are so many product recalls and that can be true even for tech companies where they have to stop the production of a certain phone model or it could be true for an fmcg company where because of some chemical reaction uh, in spite of receiving regulatory clearances they've had to withdraw the product or completely uh, rebrand themselves uh, even if you see the example of fair and lovely right a negative customer review uh, after the black lives matter and how the issue went out of proportion you had to change your ad campaign and customer positioning and product positioning so that's another marketing risk where i would say that uh, declining sales due to faulty advertising messaging and communication right again how your marketing is impacting your sales it's a direct nexus and while i've given you so many examples from different uh, processes or different departments in an organization i'd like to understand from you again you can unmute yourself or put it on the chat box are you seeing any other process level risks uh, you know what what do you think after this study support session uh, we're going to go back and identify some of the process level risks for a manufacturing company Uh, just thinking aloud uh yeah would it be like you know uh, losing uh, uh good customers or uh, losing our uh, say certifications or approvals by the customers due to poor ehs so are you are you saying losing credibility from customers no no we see normally some facilities manufacturing facilities are required an approval they require an approval Correct. Uh, and if if you th th there is an audit for EHS and how the processes are done and a uh, lot of things that are under audit. So while you know many things you have already covered, I just yeah. thought you know maybe that. So could I'll, be I'll one give you point. an example. I'll give you an example. A couple of years back, I had gone to Hong Kong for uh, you know a supplier audit, and I don't want to give the name of the company because it's it's a global company enlisted, and this was one of their subsidiaries from whom they were procuring the raw materials. And as part of the supplier audit, we realized that there were child labor issues. And immediately, three days later, I don't know from where it got leaked out, but somewhere in the newspaper, it came out that this company is uh, having child labor and uh, you know all the products are being manufactured. And you know how these things are very sensitive globally. India also people are realizing, but globally it's still sensitive. You won't believe their sales went down by 90% because the customers were so empathetic towards the situation that they said that we don't want to buy the product because if you are having child laborers, you're not complying with regulations. Why should we work with your company? Right. So uh, right. I think this fits within the larger example which you're trying to give that if you have certain licenses, certain approvals, and suddenly those get withdrawn because of malpractices or bad practices, uh, it could be an increasing risk from a sales point of view. Good. Any any other examples? I mean, let's try and make this as interactive as possible. Otherwise, I mean, I can go through the 13, 15 slides in 20 minutes and finish the presentation. The idea is that uh, I ensure all my sessions are as interactive as possible so that you are you're equipped with, uh, you know, hands on knowledge 
to uh, implement risk management uh, immediately after the session. And if you feel we've covered most of the areas or most of the risks, happy to proceed further. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So the first step of risk identification or uh, you know, one of the first activities is process level risk identification. The second activity from where you will identify risks is your stakeholder analysis. Now, who is a stakeholder? You've got internal stakeholders, you've got external stakeholders. Your internal stakeholders are your employees, your shareholders, your uh, investors, the board, uh, departments, subsidiary companies, divisions, holding company, everyone. And external stakeholders are your regulators, uh, government level departments, trade bodies, uh, it could be customers, suppliers, anyone outside the organization. Now, how do you conduct a stakeholder analysis? This is what we call assessment of attitude. On the Y axis, you have something known as power. And on the X axis, you have something got as interest. The interest is your interest in a particular stakeholder. Your interest in a particular stakeholder as an organization. Is it low or is it high? And the power is their power on you as an organization. So I repeat, the Y axis is the power. The X axis is the interest. The amount of interest you have in a particular stakeholder from low to high and the amount of power they have on you between low to high, that will determine the attitude or the requirement of the stakeholder. Let's take an example, government. Your interest in the government is always very high because you know any regulatory change is going to impact you. And their power on you is equally high. So the government becomes a key player. And for a key player, you have to engage and manage them actively. Why do you have these manufacturers association? Why do you have trade bodies? Why do you have policy advocacy groups? Why do you have roundtable conferences? Because you're trying to influence the government. You're trying to pass the message. There are GST issues, there are income tax issues, there are online portal issues. You're not able to, uh, I don't know, there could be compliance level issues where you're not getting clearances on time. Where do you voice this out? This is a platform through the roundtable conferences where you're constantly informing your stakeholder what is to be done. Let's take another example where you have Assume you're HUL and you're selling Dove, Dove soaps. Now imagine a customer in Bihar who's bought your Dove soap, just one customer. Where do you think he or she would fit in this quadrant? It's going to be low interest and low power. So for them, just monitor and inform occasionally. The power will increase if there is one negative feedback. Imagine one of your Dove soaps as some chemical which causes a skin rash or creates some uh, reaction on the body of the, of the customer. And that customer then starts talking to 10 other local people. And those 10 become 100, 2000. You've got the consumer quote which gets involved. So that's the power of one single customer. And that's why the power is high, even though your interest may be very low on that one customer. And what is the requirement? you got to understand and satisfy their needs. And that's why traditionally in all FMCG companies which manufacture large scale products, every single customer is going to be a high power customer because they're always fearful of a negative tweet or a negative feedback on Facebook or a negative customer review on Zomato, right? So the stakeholder analysis will actually help you in the risk identification because you are now going to understand which stakeholder you've got to manage. Where can the risk come from? You've got a potential government regulation change. That is a risk. You've got a potential negative customer review as a risk because the power is high, the interest is low. So through this X and Y axis and the analysis of key stakeholders, you've got to identify the risk and keep it ready with you in the risk identification. Next slide. Coming to the external event analysis, this is what we call is the IRM risk wheel. Now, if you see, we've covered the entire universe of risk management. 
at the third step, you now have to identify what are the external events which can potentially impact your manufacturing company. Are you going to see economic crisis? Are you going to see political instability? Are you going to see some reputational issues? Uh, I'll give you an example. We were auditing, uh, you know, a cement plant and there was another company which tried to fill up the cement, their, their cement in the bags of another cement company. So that means the brand outside was company A and the cement inside was of company B. And they tried to do this to mess around with the reputation of that uh, other company. Right. So this can be a classic example of competition and external risk. Technology, change, business continuity, legal liabilities, employment, supply chain crisis, governance, liquidity, credit and market. All these areas are going to be, uh, you know, giving you a range of risks and uh, external events. So are you ensuring that as part of the risk identification, you have identified risks from all these external areas? Next slide. This is what we call as risk brainstorming and interviews. So as, as the fourth step of risk identification, you got to go back to your organization and conduct rounds of surveys and questionnaires. Here is where you involve the key stakeholders to understand what are the risks that they face. We were doing this exercise for a, a large manufacturing company. They were in the steel sector and uh, it's very surprising when we took a survey of their 90 department heads, uh, every department head actually pointed out that there is a problem in the procurement team. They are taking kickbacks. All the legal clearances for the procurement team are coming within five to seven working days, whereas the average time was 15 days. So there is some connection between legal and procurement. Either they are friends or they are talking to each other unofficially. And that's why the clearances are coming in time. So when you take a survey of 100 people, you involve your key stakeholders within the company into a brainstorming session. That's when you will find new, new risks coming to the forefront. Uh, another example is if you appoint a consultant to do a risk survey, you can talk to customers discreetly and you can just say that you are an independent consultant and you want to understand that is this company complying uh, with some of the uh, policies and procedures? Are you happy with the overall uh, after sales services because if there is a person from within the company who will call they're always going to say everything is perfect because there's a relationship you don't want to spoil the name you know you have to constantly keep buying products from this company so you don't want to affect your bargaining power and the pricing but if an independent person calls and they do a check there will always be scope for improvement and hence we say that risk brainstorming and risk interviews and discrete surveys and questionnaires will give you some of the best risks. This is like an unofficial whistleblower for a manufacturing company. Imagine you calling up a plant manager uh, and saying that you have been appointed by the company to conduct a discrete exercise of risk management. That plant manager will actually open up the doors of communication with you. He or she will, uh, you know, talk so many stories. Hamara ya ye hota hai, wo problem hai, staff ka support nahi hai. It, it's just a channel for venting out. And this venting out is very, very important because that will open up multiple sources of risks. Next slide. Competitor analysis. Now, risk management cannot be completed without understanding the market. I said external events, but here I'm talking specifically for competitors. If you just go on Google News or any other news site and you type your competitor name, supposing you are Godrej Consumer Products or you are Tata Steel, or your reliance industry find out the name of your competitor and try and type any negative word fire flood loss non-compliance shutdown these are all negative words associated with risk right if you see any kind of negative news which says that okay xyz company had to shut down their plant in pune or abc company had to shut down their operations in this area because of a fire or a theft you are now accumulating external events of your competition so that you are better prepared to manage these events. If something has happened within your ecosystem, this is nothing but market intelligence. Are you prepared to understand what can go wrong to your competitors, to your peers? And are you also understanding 
we impact the probability of that event so that you can develop the risk mitigation strategy in advance right so study the negative news look at the financials understand the operating cost models and that way you will be able to create a long list of loss events and risks faced by the competitors the last one we can go next the last one of the entire risk identification is the SWOT analysis this is one of the traditional exercises which we've always seen in organizations uh, and it's a classic management tool the SWOT analysis SWOT analysis will actually help you bifurcate between the strengths weakness opportunities and you may even find a lot of repetitive events uh, coming from uh, you know the previous five uh, steps of risk management or the risk identification but this will just help you plot that if you've seen some process level risk you've seen some stakeholder external event risk brainstorming how do you plot it where does it fit within strengths weakness threats and opportunities right so this completes your overall risk identification exercise and what happens next so we can go to the next slide <clears throat> here is now we are moving into risk analysis and evaluation all the risks that you have now identified from your stakeholder from your competitor from your swot analysis you got to now compile them into a risk register what is the template of the risk register i'll show you in the next slide after we finish this one but all these risks we need to be brought together it could be a root cause it could be a risk it could be an impact it could be strategic risk it could be operational risk any level of risk you got to bring that together and compile in the format of a risk register sorry just give me one second sorry so once you get all these risks you got to compile them in the format of a risk register the second step after you've compiled in a risk register is you got to rate the risk an average manufacturing organization will have anywhere between 200 to 2000 risks this is from my experience with companies this is from a general study of all the annual reports an average manufacturing company can have anywhere between 200 to 2000 if you have anywhere less than 200 risks you've not done the risk management exercise properly right because of the large extensive value chain the kind of departments the kind of heavy operations it doesn't matter what your turnover is doesn't matter how small your team is if you are in manufacturing you are producing products trust me from all the processes stakeholders all the analysis you should get at least 200 risks and it can go up to as high as 2000 depending on the scale of the company so how do you then shortlist which risk should we uh, find a solution for an organization can identify 2000 risks that can be at a plant it can happen in hr department procurement department legal department r d uh, finance treasury sales customer service but is the board really going to look at 2000 risks probably not you got to empower the teams to manage their own set of risks so which are the risks which should come at the top how do you know which are the top five risks that is what we called as risk prioritization and for risk prioritization to happen you will have to rate the risk as per the impact and the likelihood now what is impact impact is how much how much will the risk impact and where will it impact the impact can be financial it can be reputation it can be legal it can be across the board and the likelihood is how many times what is the frequency of the risk that is going to impact that business element or that business process so this happens across the board in terms of setting the risk appetite the risk appetite is defined as the amount of risk you are willing to take and for a risk appetite statement you have to first define the areas 
of impact for the manufacturing company like i said the areas are financial reputation legal uh, it could be safety because of the number of accidents and then there is a 3 by 3 or a 4 by 4 or a 5 by 5 scale when i say 3 by 3 means this what you see on the screen is a 5 by 5 a 3 by 3 will have maximum 9 a 4 by 4 will have maximum 16 because risk calculation is a production is a multiplication sorry and it's a multiplication of impact into likelihood the impact can be rated as 1 to 5 likelihood also can be rated as 1 to 5 and that's why 5 into 5 25 how do you decide what is 1 what is 5 or what is 1 what is 3 that comes from your impact areas let's say you want to assess a financial impact so you got to decide how much risk are you willing to take and for a financial impact maybe a 3 could be anywhere between 2 to 3 percent of the net worth or 2 to 3 percent of the profitability of the company for a reputation it could be anywhere between not more than 10 negative news articles in a year so that's a financial impact i mean a reputation impact a legal impact could be not more than five to seven legal notices a year that way you then reduce the number for a two you further reduce the number for a one because one rating is acceptable three rating is a catastrophic right as you see on the screen and that's how you draw up the risk appetite once you draw up the risk appetite you will go back to your risk register and you will visit each of the 200 or 2000 risks and you will start plotting them okay risk number one let's say delay in land acquisition for a new plant setup the impact of this risk is always going to be very high because if there is a delay you're not going to start production if the production doesn't start it's going to increase your cost it's going to delay your sales very high impact what is the likelihood the likelihood is very very low that's why one rating and that's why that risk is five into one five now where does that five sit the five will sit on that green on the y-axis because the higher on impact but low on frequency right if i look at delay in turnaround time for delivery of goods you're going to have massive customer complaints which is again decreasing sales and the frequency of this could be every day so high on frequency which is number five but the impact could be anywhere around three so i would say that is five into three 15 and it's going to sit on your x-axis just below 20 15. this is how you look at prioritizing all the risks and once you prioritize the risk you will know which are the top five to top 10 risks for the manufacturing company let's go to the next slide where we'll now look at the uh, template I just had a question yeah uh, how about uh, you know putting this rating on the positive uh, aspects about the risk so we initially spoke about that risk is not just looking at all the negative aspects about you know outcomes negative outcomes uh, what if we are looking at an opportunity what if we are looking at an uh, you know uh, uh, some some sort of an advantage by uh, a new industry coming up next to our industry wherein you know there is something which we didn't really work out but this is an unforeseen or unpredictable outcome how do we put that into this risk register right so what happens is uh, you know once you have prioritized the risk you will then get into risk mitigation and in risk mitigation you will be able to understand how do you identify the right opportunity from that risk on the flip side the risk appetite statement or that risk heat map that you see uh, will always have the other side of the one to five scale i have not brought it up because you know i was requested for a very uh, preliminary uh, explanation of the overall risk appetite but what i can do is after this presentation i can circulate how do you look at opportunity calculation uh, from a particular risk sure. thank you so this is the risk register template if you see on the top you have a project you have a project manager and you have the date of the last update the reason for having the date of the last update that shows that risk management is a dynamic exercise you can't do risk management once and then shut down for 15 years or five years every day you got to invest in risk management i'll give you an example of a swiss swiss-based manufacturing company 
uh, I remember doing their risk consulting assignment back in 2015. And, uh, you know, it, it's a very classic case study. They invested, of course, some amount in technology, but every employee had a mobile app. Okay. And at the end of the day, once they submit their attendance, along with the attendance, they're, sub they're supposed to provide three crucial input fields. The first one, what is the risk that you observe today? Number two, is this coming from a specific department or is it generally applicable to the organization? And the third one, how serious do you think this risk is in terms of attention for the board? every day before every single employee in that manufacturing company they punch in their attendance they get these three pieces of information and the risk committee and the risk management group or the risk management employees they sit and analyze across the board what are the different risks that identified by the employees from the plant to the supply chain to the hr because people are just going to talk problems i didn't get incentive I did not, uh, I saw someone taking a bribe. I saw the plant manager is not coming to the office on time. I see there is a production delay. I see some suppliers are coming too often to the plant to meet the plant manager. I suspect something is wrong. You will find whistleblowers. You will find sexual harassment cases. You will have people uh, talking about incentive policies and complaining. You will have someone talking about competition, right? So these are the kinds of risks which will come to the forefront by way of that app based exercise and that way you will be able to update your risk register almost every week so this is the dynamism of a risk management exercise and if you see the columns you got a risk id number you've got a risk class you've got a risk description i think mr ashish has written that he is unwell so he yeah, has yeah, quit. yeah yes yes sure. he has uh, suffered for a dengue that's what okay no 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 problem no problem so then you look at the risk description, the impact, uh, the probability level, the priority, the mitigation strategy, the action plan, and who is the owner. It's very important to understand who owns the risk. Without identifying the source or the root cause, you will never be able to solve the risk. So I hope this risk register template is there. You can take a screenshot, use it for your company, even use it as a tool to advise. And towards the end, I will also explain how uh, we as IRM are supporting chartered accountancy firms to build a risk consultancy practice. Next. Now, what are the four types of risk mitigation? Once you've brought all these risks from the universe together, you've done the risk rating, you've identified all the risks, you've prioritized the risk, you got to mitigate the top five risks which are going to pose a serious threat to the survival of the company. And the four strategies which companies use is accept, avoid, transfer, and reduce. Accept means it's a low risk. You got to live with it. You can't change anything. For example, if GST is a risk, you have to accept it because the government has implemented it. You can't say it is a compliance risk and I will work and I will change and I will join the politics and I'll try and transform the policy. Not possible. So you got to accept the risk. Avoid. Oh, I just, uh, I just wanted to interrupt Harsh. So whether this uh, risk can be inert and risk can be called as an inert and risk? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So that is the acceptance of the risk. Now coming to the second element, which is the avoid. Here is where you try and uh, completely cut down the source of the risk. Let me give you an example. You have a joint venture with someone. It's been three years and that manufacturing joint venture is not working out. You're seeing the cost is increasing. The sales are not going up. The reputation of the company is at risk and there are so many other activities. Uh, how do you solve this kind of a risk? The answer is you just cut down the joint venture. You completely avoid the risk. You remove the risk from the source because that is causing more problems and less opportunities. The third one is transfer. Insurance is a classic example. Outsourcing is another example. There are certain activities which are better performed by external firms. So you outsource that activity. Some risks you don't want to manage internally, transfer it to an insurance company. And the last one 
is reduce how do you reduce it you reduce the source of the risk you have a certain set of employees within a department who are causing a nuisance to the culture of the organization you try and downsize that team you try and outsource that activity so there's always going to be a conflicting strategy between avoid and reduce or transfer and reduce but reduce is one of the strategies to just try and reduce that activity it can also be a profit center or a cost center which is not giving you much results you start a new product you try and manufacture it doesn't work but the break even is still visible so you reduce the cost but yet try and achieve the break even by maintaining a limited amount of sales for that division right so that is reduction so these are the four generic types of risk mitigation strategies and at a broad level somewhere or the other your risk solutions will fit within these risk mitigations next now our first industry practice case i've taken the example of godrej consumer products and this is all available from public data if you see the top two paragraphs it's from their investor relation report we have a comprehensive and structured approach for risk management as gcpl again i would like to repeat this is from public data uh, i have not accessed any of the private documents or uh, neither irm is endorsing any of the practices this is from uh, general best practices that we see on the public websites and annual report across our geographies we have integrated our risk management practices into the operating framework and reporting channels and of course gcpl has several manufacturing facilities in india spread over seven locations uh, those locations are mentioned now what a wonderful way of putting down the risk that godrej consumer products faces this is what they have officially disclosed on their website and even in some of their public documents so that the suppliers the customers the employees shareholders everyone is aware that godrej knows that these are the risks and they are constantly working hard to mitigate these risks and i think if you look at all these risks this is something which we even discuss on the chat box and they will also serve as an exercise or an example for future manufacturing companies potential disruption of operations labor intensive product portfolio in some geographies inability to deliver material to the customer as per agreed delivery dates uh dependency on few product categories competitive market conditions macroeconomic risks exchange rate volatility community unrest shortages due to industrial dispute repercussions of natural and man made disaster compliance all your categories of risks are covered so this is the first case of how a manufacturing company is disclosing the categories of risk the next slide here is where i want to show you the example of ashok leland next slide please yeah so this is what ashok leland has disclosed in their annual report the risk management they've written that your company has established a robust erm framework complying with coso erm 2017 and even iso 31000 and the erm process is overseen by the risk management committee of the board which is responsible to ensure that the company is at an appropriate and effective framework for managing and reporting significant enterprise risk even the opportunities and threats it's a long paragraph but i just wanted to put a screenshot to show you how the company is publicly making available the information which they feel should be known to the investors before investing in the stock price they are clearly communicating that this is the business model risk this is the supplier level risk this is the reputation level risk and as the board we recognize we understand that we are going to face these risks now it's up to you whether you want to associate with the company or no but as a best practice it is our duty to inform everyone so i just thought i'll share these two uh, classic examples of how companies are disclosing their risk management practices next <coughs> so on a concluding note i just like to share these three publications which i would love all the participants to download there is a risk culture guide which you can use for manufacturing companies there is an irm risk management global corporations publication which you can use uh, you know for understanding the overall global risk taxonomy uh, there is a climate change risk management document right uh, which uh, you can again use as 
a reference point in future because that's one of the global publications which we've just released on how companies can develop a climate change risk management framework so these three publications are uh, really helpful and in addition to this i'll be more than happy to uh, support all the chartered accountants who are present today in terms of helping their ca firm build some kind of risk consultancy practice if any of your articles or any of your uh, you know employees within the ca firm want to understand how to become a certified risk professional not just in finance but enterprise risk the website link is given here you can even contact me on my email address and i'll connect you to the right team so that you can avail the professional examinations and scholarships in case uh, you want to work with the irm so thank you once again uh, bhavin and uh, murtuza and the entire wirc team i'll be open to taking any questions and uh, look forward to more such engaging engaging sessions in the future uh, thank you harsh for such a wonderful and in a short span of time uh, gave a very detailed presentation and definitely would be coming back for the opportunity which you will be sharing to us and for the risk management uh, the reference uh, manual itself so i will be circulating among the members in our whatsapp group also for the same and let's see how we can stay in touch with you so excellent uh, insights with respect to the risk management what i have been uh, uh, with also with respect to the external shareholder even my organization was basically facing for the same so a very detailed explanation any members i would request wanted to ask some questions yes uh, hi i think yeah, harsh yeah i have a question harsh i'm rita here Uh, tell us more about I, uh, this institute of risk management is it an international body indian body if it's an international body which country it emanates from and when was it formed can you give a brief background about this institute hi rita so uh, yes thanks for the question irm is headquartered in the uk we are present in 140 plus countries i head the india chapter of irm uh, reason why you would have not heard about irm in india is because we recently set up 360 examination centers in india uh, and earlier students and professionals had to travel abroad to give these professional exams uh, but we had a huge demand and a lot of students uh, started writing to us that they want to become a certified fellow just like the ca charter we have five level examinations the ca has three and we have five so you start with the level 1 exam in india that's completely online the level 2 exam you can go to any of the 360 exam centers and you become an irm cert holder so you finish your irm cert designation level 3 again it's uh, 12 to 18 months and you get a grad irm designation level 4 is cm irm and finally at level 5 you get a cf irm so across the globe in 140 countries we have a large community of chief risk officers business leaders accountants consultants who have completed the five levels and they are recognized as certified enterprise risk management professionals i've put the link to the india website uh, on the chat box you can have a look at that uh, if you want to know more about the five levels i can always get the examination office to contact you uh, because we have a dedicated uh, back office working in india just like the icai or any other professional body so all these five levels exams are to be given in india or for certain levels yes. one has to travel abroad No, no, no. All all five levels can be given in India now because IRM India chapter is there. But don't worry, the recognition is global. You get all the certification and designation from the IRM UK head office, and uh, you've got a lot of study support, webinars, uh, a lot of uh, handbook materials which are available as part of the exam fees. In fact, the level one exam fee is uh, highly subsidized for Indian professionals because we recognize that now regulators are asking for qualified risk professionals and even companies are writing to us that we want someone who's completed irm level 1 irm level 2 so and this is slightly different from the garp frm garp frm is only on financial risk irm is the world leader for enterprise risk so we have one of the largest communities and largest chapter presence for uh, enterprise risk management and our curriculum covers your cyber attack reputation supply chain crisis digital risk management across the board Okay, so these three hundred and sixty centers are your are in India. Yes, yes, and globally there are five thousand centers. Okay, so there may be major cities. Uh, these testing centers, which are there. 
yes yes major cities but level one is completely online level one you can give it at the comfort of your home or office okay okay and what is the duration for the entire five levels um uh, minimum duration to yeah level one is about three months level two is six to nine months so within a year you can finish one and two level three goes on for 18 months so that's a uh, uh, another one and a half year so two and a half and level four and five is only granted based on your experience so four and five is not an exam it is basically uh, an application form where you need to submit to the institute that you have certain work experience in risk so now please upgrade my level from three to four and again after working in four you just say you please upgrade to level five okay okay you also mentioned that if anybody needs help in terms of setting up the risk practice in your company what kind of help you all provide in that area and do you charge for it and if you charge for it what's about what your charges so i'll just explain we have a collaboration with the bombay chartered accountancy society uh, where uh, we are organizing multiple webinars for chartered accountancy firms on how should they develop a risk consultancy practice and uh, the way we do it is with articles who are pursuing the ca exam you nominate select articles to even take up the irm exams we will give them a certain scholarship in the level one exam and once they complete the irm exams they will be equipped to start setting up a risk consultancy team and as irm we will then give you access to some of our global resources uh, you will be invited to for global free webinars and knowledge sessions constantly so that you can pass that knowledge and benefit to your clients and we can also supply you with qualified talent we have a large alumni pool in india who've completed either level one, level two, level three. So they can easily go for uh, a CA firm and help you set up a completely uh, large risk consultancy, uh, you know, department. Okay. And the charges for the exam, everything is given on the website? The link that I have given that has the entire five level pathway. If you want, I'll just uh, put the entire career path. So for the benefit of the entire audience, and uh, Rita, if you could just on personal chat, send me your email address. I will get uh, one of the team members to uh, send you a detailed note. Okay, okay, sure. So this is the entire career path from level one to level five to become a certified fellow or a chief risk officer. And in fact, some chartered accountant partners are also going for these exams. Uh, they may get some exemption if they've done some work in risk management. Uh, but the idea is then in terms of the client representation it brings a lot more confidence because you are certified by a global body uh harsh you can also send it to us also myself sure. and purvi the reason sure. is that if, because the many of the participants i don't know for whatsoever reason they have joined a very limited session so if they want it then we can share it because this presentation slide will be also uploaded on WRC. That's all. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Harsh. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very detailed session. I really enjoyed. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, Harsh. Thank, thank. It was a very good, uh, very simply put and. It was a very good session. Thank you. Thanks, Nita. Happy to hear any feedback, any suggestions. Uh, I mean, Bhavin, more than happy to take up any other specific topic in the future. So if there are no questions, I, uh, I can leave. Harsh, we can all log off. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Harsh. Bye. It was a very nice session. Uh, 
आधे घंटे बाद में उसका फोन आया तो बोला सर अभी मैं बाहर निकल रही हूँ आधा घंटे बाद इसके बाद डेफर टेक सेट लाइबिलिटी किसने चेक किया था चेक किया था कि नहीं किया था
ये तो गलत ही उसका फिर हाची